Fantastic. Okay, hello everybody. My name is Susan Gerbic, if you haven't met me before. Troy's here. Is um, he? Yeah. Somebody I just lost it. it. <laughs> oh, don't look. I'll, I'll keep an eye on it because I got my other Okay, one. so I don't need to look at the chat. I can just talk. <laughs> I would. Okay. I'll, I'll let you know if there's somebody who wants to, uh, has a great question. Okay. So uh, I am Susan Gerbic. I am your host today for About Time Presents. This is a ongoing um, lecture series with interesting and unusual friends of mine, and I have many. If you'd like to suggest somebody that I should be speaking to, please let me know. I have no set time or day that I do these. I tend to broadcast them on Facebook Live, and then the video will appear on YouTube and our channel, which I'm about to post on the uh, discussion here on Facebook, our channel. Please subscribe. We're at 95 subscribers, you guys. If I hit 100, <laughs> I get... I get um, extra perks with YouTube. <clears throat> so please, I need five subscribers. I know that sounds really silly, but there's a whole bunch of lectures. I think we've done a little over 25 lectures. A lot of them have been on facilitated communication and um, a bunch on psychics. And there's so many more I wanna do. I have a lecture coming up pretty soon on Wednesday with Janice Poynton, and it is with uh, Howard Shane, who is going to be talking to us about communication this will be part of our series on facilitated communication, but Howard Shane is not going to be talking a lot about facilitated communication. He's going to be talking about how people who are um, have severe communication problems, how they can communicate. In fact, he worked with Stephen Hawking. So um, mm -hmm. that should be fascinating. Howard Shane is also the person who, who tested Janice Boynton back when she was a facilitator, where she was able to realize that she was moving, um, she was moving the person's hand. And so it should be really interesting. And it's gonna be on Janice's birthday, which is even kind of fun because she's like really excited about meeting Howard Shane again, and it'll be on her birthday. So today we're gonna to be talking about an interesting topic. This is something I know very little about, um, Tourette's. Um, and also we're gonna be talking about OCD, right? right. And this is Adrian Hill. She'll introduce herself in just a minute. She's one of my GSOW editors. We, uh, a great friend of mine. We talk all the time. She's up there in Calgary. That's north for me. And that's in Canada. <laughs> oh, Canada. <laughs> oh, Canada. So she's got her bacon, back bacon and her beer right there on her. No. <laughs> Maple syrup. Maple syrup. So <laughs> she will be telling you a little bit about herself. Plus the conference is going to be coming up in May. May, yeah, May, May 15th. Yeah. So it's, so it's really going to be exciting, but today her, uh, this is her expertise on uh, Tourette's and uh, I should also mention that Adrian has given us a talk right from the beginning, way a long time ago on her journey with the uh, Gorilla Skepticism on Wikipedia project and how she, her first page she wrote was on Haunted House and her uh, just all kinds of interesting things about what she learned as she went. <clears throat> So just the little technical things I should let you all know about. I'm in California and uh, all my windows are now closed, but it is very smoky here. So if I am coughing and, and <clears throat> clearing my throat is because of the smoke. And, it is not uh, Tourette syndrome. Yeah, it's not <laughs> so it's smoky here and I've got a fan on. Hopefully it's not such a problem, but I need to have some air movement in here. And also um, this is my cat Hamilton who will be joining us today. He's our official cat on the internet we all need one of course to make to saint the set sanctify the um the talk we're going to be doing mm -hmm. and there's a bird feeder right outside the window which is why he sits there nice and sunshine i have a second screen on my right hand side which is where i will be looking for chat and looking for um other information playing solitaire on the side no. <laughs> <laughs> this is on the right hand side you will be able i will be able to see your 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 questions as they come up please ask them as we go i cannot see them if they i can see like the last five and then they fall off of the uh, chat and i can't scroll back on it without um messing with the the format i have here so if i don't answer your question or ask your question i probably maybe you should ask it again i will like it if you ask it and that way you know i've seen it okay and this will appear on our youtube channel later and i think that's all i need to say i haven't done a talk in like a week so i've forgotten all the things i usually say oh the about time project is a nonprofit 
uh, you can find more information about us on our website, and I will put that in a link as well. If you'd like to leave us money, and you will, <laughs> we'll take it. <clears throat> we do all kinds of different things, not only the Wikipedia project, but uh, grief vampires, um, facilitated communication, and assorted other things that is so interesting to me as well. All right, Adrian. Yes. It's your turn. Can you introduce yourself to everybody who have not met you before and give them a little bit of your creds as well as an overview of what we're going to be talking about today? Perfect. Yeah, no, I, uh, as you said, I live in Calgary, Alberta, Canada, and I've actually lived in three different places. I've lived in British Columbia, Vancouver is where uh, my, my kid, two of my kids were born and one was born in Edmonton, Alberta, which is just north of me. And so I have three boys. And the, it's been an adventure having those three boys because uh, two of the three of them have been diagnosed with Tourette syndrome plus, and I'll describe what that is a little later. It means, well, essentially it means that they have Tourette syndrome plus uh, comorbid or associated disorders like ADHD, obsessive compulsive disorder, sleep disorder, rage disorder. You can go on and on and on. There's, uh, I once heard a lecturer say that Tourette syndrome was sort of the granddaddy of disorder and that there's all these things that can fall underneath it. It's like an umbrella. Uh, however, just to, to be clear, you can't have ADHD without Tourette syndrome and OCD without Tourette syndrome. It's just that people with Tourette syndrome usually have associated disorders, so it's not just the tics. Uh, I'm a teacher, a retired teacher. I taught for over 30 years, high school math and junior high math. And when my kids uh, got the the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, I thought as a teacher, I would love to help teachers learn how to teach kids with these disorders. And Tourette Canada had a program that trained people to do that. So I enrolled in the program and became trained. And all the materials were always vetted by uh, neurologists, so people, and psychiatrists, so they were always vetted by people who understood the disorder, had the latest and greatest research, so, you know, we felt that we, uh, what we were saying was correct to the best of our knowledge at the time, and so I went through the training, and uh, so I ended up going into schools, talking to universities, talking to teachers who were about to go out into the world, graduating teachers at universities, telling them about Tourette syndrome, ADHD, OCD, all these other disorders, and how best to help them in the classroom. And I did that for 13 years. And then um, my health started to deteriorate. I have migraine headaches that are, were very, very severe. I, my, my job, my, actually my school closed, so I, it was kind of good timing for my health, and uh, I had to kind of step back from Tourette Canada, but there was a lovely neurologist here in, in uh, Calgary who I reached out to and said, you know, I'm stopping my volunteer work with Tourette Canada, is there something I can do here locally? And she said, and her name's Tamara Pringsheim, Dr. Tamara Pringsheim, she's a neurologist. And she, I'd worked with her before with Tourette Canada. She was one of the board advisory on the committee because that's her specialty is Tourette syndrome. And she um, said, let me think about it for three weeks. I'll get back to you and see if I have something. And two days later, she came back to me and said, you know, we have a real need in Alberta. Uh, the, the psychiatrist that had diagnosed my kids had retired and he was in Edmonton. And all of a sudden, all his patients had no place to go. So it was quite a crisis. And so she said, we know we need to develop something for our province to help these people who have been abandoned. And so she started the Tourette OCD Alberta Network. Talk about a go-getter. She said three weeks and two days later, she had this organization that she was going to start. So she applied for a grant and that took, of course, many months to, to go through. She got the grant, she won the grant and created uh, the Tourette OCD Alberta Network. And you notice that I said before that Tourette syndrome often includes ADHD, OCD uh, and other disorders. And we decided to leave ADHD out of the, the network because we felt it was managed quite well. It was, there were lots of people who were experts in it, uh, Schools tended to now tend to do really well with students with ADHD. There's, the strategies are out there. There's lots of specialists that have 
studied it and there's lots of data on it. So if teachers are willing, they can actually find help. On the other hand, Tourette and OCD are very poorly understood still. And so we thought that we would focus our attentions on just those two disorders to try and get the funding and we were able to do that. And so I'm actually on the founding board of that organization along with a bunch of neurologists and psychiatrists and then there's me a teacher. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's very exciting that the people are great. Uh, of course, I continue to learn a lot. It's changing all the time, you know, the, the, the ideas and uh, strategies continue to change and grow as we know more because uh, it's only until recently that a lot of this stuff has uh, started to be studied. I think OCD wasn't an official diagnosis uh, until in 1980s. Oh, so, right. wow. Yeah, yeah. so that, you know, some of this stuff is fairly new. Tourette has been around a long time. Like it's been well documented since the 1800s. And actually the guy's name is Gilles de la Tourette. Um, he was French and it's named after him. He was the first one to sort of write about it in detail. Uh, it's been around forever, but he was sort of the first one to, to really uh, write about it. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a little idea as to my credentials, because you were saying you were going to ask me, why should you trust yeah, me? Yeah, <laughs> I already, I don't have to ask you now. So, <laughs> okay, audience. So I know a little bit about Tourette's, not a heck of a lot about Tourette's, hardly at all, but I mean, probably more than just somebody walking off the street, <laughs> maybe. And most people I, don't know what it really yeah, is. Yeah, unless you, I guess you had a reason to know about it. Okay, so yeah. I'm going to be talking to uh, Adrian, and some of the questions I'm going to ask are probably going to be pretty basic and pretty like, uh, hopefully not too blunt, but I, I do have some questions and I want to, and so be, be kind to me out there when I ask and you say, Jesus, and how could you not know that or whatever? And that wasn't very tactful or whatever, but Adrian is a good friend of mine and I, and she's been quite open about that. Her, her kids have, have this mm -hmm. and so on. And and let's let's see. I mean, we can look up a lot of this on the Wikipedia page. There's there's a uh, terrific Wikipedia page, as our go-to is uh, Wikipedia usually. And Adrian I has to do that. She looked <laughs> it over bits of it and says it looks like it's really well written and it's yeah. got um, some great citations on there and it probably explains things pretty well. So let me ask you some questions that I do have about this. Do we? You said this has been this has been since the eighteen hundreds. People have I mean, it's obviously probably been around a lot longer than oh, that yeah. since yeah. humans have been doing human things. Yeah. But um, has there been any famous people that we would know of that are sufferers? Do we say sufferers of Tourette's? Is that a correct? Yeah, I think so. Um, they certainly have the disorder and it can be very difficult. And like any disorder, there's a spectrum. There's you know, they have a, a small amount of it and uh, all the way up to a large amount. And my middle boy actually has tics. Uh, to qualify for Tourette syndrome, you have to have both vo uh, vocal tic and motor tic. And you have to have it for more than uh, a year. And it has to have onset before age 18. And it can't be as a result of, say, concussion, because you can get Tourette-like stuff if you have concussion or if you've had drug issues, oh, drug interactions. Yeah. But, uh, you know, so, so if you qualify for that, uh, that, my middle boy actually has Tourette syndrome because he has both, both verbal and uh, motor tics. However, they're so mild that we never had to have any interventions for him. He did very well in school. He, he had no issues. So we never had him see a psychiatrist or a neurologist or, uh, you know, psych, uh, psychologist, et cetera, occupational therapist. Uh, so a famous person that I can think of right off the bat, and this is disputed because we don't really know, we can't diagnose, of course, back in the past, is Mozart. Apparently, he, his behaviors and his letters that he wrote indicated that it's a very possible that he had Tourette syndrome. Uh, so he, that's one person that I can think of. There's also basketball players. You can look them up. They might even be on the Wikipedia page, but basketball players, baseball players, race car drivers, Jazz musicians, there's, uh, you know, I can't, I'm terrible with names, so I can't think of them off the top of my head. But there's, yeah, there's many. There was even a fellow on American Idol not that long ago. That, oh, I think I remember that. Yeah, yeah, that had Tourette syndrome. So uh, it's a lot more common than people realize. 
uh, Oliver Sacks. I don't, you know, Oliver Sacks, do you? I do love he's Oliver Sacks. Yeah. yeah. He, oh he's, God. I'm a fan of his. And he, he was one of the early modern people who really studied Tourette syndrome. And he had his first case in the 1970s. And at that time, they believed the incidence was about one in a million. But he thought that couldn't be right because as he was out walking, he could see people ticking. And so he thought there's something not quite right with this. They now believe that it's about 1% of the child and adolescent population. It goes down in adulthood because quite often about 33% of the cases just resolve themselves. And that's what I was going to ask you. It does. So it, so is it, does it go away ish or is that these people tend to get better medication or better treatment or they hide it better? Or what All of the above. <laughs> so, yeah, I think it's, it's definitely developmental because when the kids like my, my oldest son was diagnosed when he was 11, but he'd been t ticking severely since the age of four. And this is where, you know, even the medical profession doesn't really have a good handle on what Tourette syndrome is. You know, one of the myths is that it's a swearing tick. So they have to be swearing and they have to be really, really severe. Otherwise, it's not Tourette syndrome. Uh, I had uh, an, an article sent by my mother-in-law uh, that outlined uh, the symptoms of Tourette syndrome. And she said, I think this is what Graham has. We'd add him to pediatricians. We'd had him to doctors and no nobody had mentioned anything. They just said, oh yeah, he's got a couple ticks. They'll go away. Don't worry about them. Just, you know, he can't help it. And there was never a mention of Tourette syndrome. And it wasn't until I got this article and I went to my doctor and said, I think maybe this is what my son has. Cause you know, I'm ticking all the boxes. <laughs> oh, <Ticking>. off. <laughs> he's got verbal tics. You know, he was squealing and squeaking and he's got very severe um, motor tics. And yeah, he, and he would say doidle all the time. Uh, say what? Doidle. Doyle? Doyle. Made up word. So, oh, it's a made up word. Okay. Oh, yeah. Not a word. He, he would just, you know, we, it, we, he would always say it you know, when he was anxious. So we would introduce him to new people. We'd say, here's our son, Graham. He goes, Doyle. And we go, Graham, that's rude. <laughs> not realizing that this was a tick and that this oh. is something he couldn't stop. He was anxious meeting these new meeting people new and ticks tend to get worse when you're anxious. So, you know, I, I, of course I learned that all later, but at the time we're like, Graham, you're being rude. What are you doing? And, uh, and so he uh, went with my doctor, when I approached her about the possible diagnosis, she says, oh, no, no, no. Tourette syndrome is a very serious diagnosis. It's not Tourette syndrome. But to give her credit, she said, but, you know, if you want, I can refer him to the Tourette clinic and see what happens. Of course, it took two years to get in. So, <laughs> or a year and a half, I can't remember. It was a long time. And once we got in, we not only left with the, the diagnosis of Tourette syndrome, but obsessive compulsive uh, issues, rage disorder, sleep disorder. I mean, we had a whole gamut of uh, issues listed, but it was life-changing for us because it was at that moment that we were able to get help. And it was that moment that we were able to give strategies to teachers. And it was a huge turnaround for us. He, it, it just, it changed his life. He, he went from being a behavior problem child to being a successful, uh, successful individual. I mean, it was, it, I'm not going to say it was easy. It wasn't like a flip a switch and here we go. But at least we had resources. When there were difficulties, we had resources. And, and he understood that it was, you know, professor? it was something, it was something, it was a medical condition. It wasn't like, I don't know, that he was a bad kid or something. Exactly. And that's one of the myths is that it's just bad behavior. It's intentional behavior. There are kids I've had, you know, since I've become aware of this, I've, I've had students in my own class with Tret syndrome and one of them uh, and I didn't have like, this is why it's so important for Tret kids to disclose is that he uh, somebody was repeating after me so I would say okay we're going to do the quadratic equation and I'd hear do the quadratic equation I'm thinking who's mocking me because it feels very intentional oh, yeah, yeah. I know about this and yet I still was thinking who's mocking me and I finally figured out who it was when the kid not only repeated me, but then hit the back wall. And I'm like, oh, I think I know what this is. And uh, it, it, it's so it's really important to understand that this is not intentional. And when they repeat after you, it's called echolalia. Mm -hmm. 
quite common. Uh, my kids had it. Uh, my youngest son had it. He, he liked to repeat himself and he also liked to repeat after others. And it can sound like you're mocking, but it's, it's not intentional and they, and they really can't. It's very difficult to stop, especially in younger children. You know, they don't have the control. And you, you sort of mentioned that when you get older, that is part of it. They learn that, you know, they, they quite often get a premonitory urge and then they can control it. So they can say it under their breath because they know that it's not socially acceptable or they can just say something else. They can divert their attention. You know, they learn strategies that make things a little more socially acceptable. And people become more accustomed to it, I assume. Janice, yeah. point, she had, um, in the series that I've been doing with Janice on facilitated communication, I hadn't heard of echo, 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 echolalia, echolalia before, <laughs> but she brought it up and I've been looking at it and it is exactly that. It's people who repeat back, but in the case of facilitated communication, these are people who probably do not understand what they're saying. They're just repeating right. and they don't understand what it means at all. So it's yeah. different. She also brings up uh, Janice on our, our Facebook page here is saying that Louis Rossigetti, I'm not going to say it right, is a main artist who has Tourette's and talks about how doing art seems to help his tics. Yeah. I think I've heard this that some people who are, they you know, uh, music or gardening or something yeah. that kind of is a way of um, peaceful, relaxing. Yeah, you know, for some. Helps some, a lot. Some relaxation and meditation can really help. Others, it can make it worse. It really? Just depends, it just it depends on the person. Uh, however, if they're intensely focused on something they love, yeah, their tics will go away. It gives them a reprieve. Uh, so my, my son plays classical guitar, and he won't tick at all when he's playing classical guitar. It's also common if kids are playing video games, the tics will go away because they're concentrating and they're having fun. Uh, sports, of course, exercise is like important for everybody, but probably more so if somebody has Tourette syndrome, it, it just drains some of the energy so that they're not going to tick as much. Oh, well, I wonder if those, those things also make it feel like the person was faking it all along because it goes away at some times. Yeah. And so that's another myth that actually is control it. Why if they controlled it there, how come they can't control it now when they're supposed to be writing a math test or writing an English essay. And the, the big thing is, is, is one is something they want to do. And two, maybe it's a test, and test increases anxiety. When you increase anxiety, the t chances of ticks coming out become much greater. Right. So, so yeah, and I always equate it when the, there's that control issue to a sneeze. I think it's a really good analogy. There are some times when we sneeze, you know how you can feel it coming on? Sometimes you can stop it. Yeah. Other times, there's no way you're stopping it. And that's exactly what it's like with Tourette's syndrome. So yeah, sometimes they can't stop it. And sometimes it's very, very difficult. The urge is so strong. They have this urge that it has to feel just right. And that's where the sort of the crossover into OCD comes in because uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, you do things over and over and over again because of anxiety, because of fear of hurting somebody. And with Tourette's syndrome, they tend to do things over and over again to, to uh, quell an urge to make things feel just right. That's how they describe it. They say it's very difficult to describe the feeling. So they feel the tick come, then it, they do the tick, and then they feel better. And then they then it goes away momentarily until the tick comes back. And the other myth actually is that it stays the same. And so that can really throw people off, especially teachers, well, parents and teachers actually, because you just feel, okay, we've got this tick on, you know, they're relaxed, we've figured out something, they're in a separate room for their exams because they're screeching all the time. Then all of a sudden that one goes away and a new one comes. And so they're constantly changing. And that's actually a diagnostic criteria for Tourette syndrome is it has to change. They have to wax and wane, so they get worse, they get better, they never stay the same. So it can be very confusing for parents and it can be very confusing for teachers. So what works one week may not work two weeks from now. So you know, I used to call it my three week on, three week off cycle. We just get something <laughs> under control. Okay, things are good, we're going along and then something else would come up. Oh my God. And so that's where uh, that support is so huge. And uh, you know, having that team, as I say, I think I've gotten to know almost every type of specialist out there. We've had dietitians, occupational therapists, psychologists, psychiatrists, neurologists, but left anybody out, uh, psychologists. 
Louis Edwards has said that the, um, on Facebook that their acquaintance has a son with Tourette's. They blink excessively. And was her blinking a sy symptom of a mild Tourette? <clears throat> yeah, blinking excessively is the most common tick. In fact, I think it's around 90% of people with Tourette syndrome will have an eye blinking tick at one point. And my kids certainly had eye blinking, eye rolling ticks. Uh, my oldest son doesn't seem to have that anymore. Uh, but yeah, it's definitely a symptom. So if they also have a vocal tick as well, and they've had these ticks for more than a year, then it could be diagnosed as Tourette syndrome. Of course, I can't diagnose. Uh, one, I'm not a doctor. And uh, <laughs> two, you'd have to see a specialist for sure to have that diagnosis. So, I, okay. I have so many questions. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry about the clearing of the throat here. Like I said, it's okay. <clears throat> I will have to get up at some point and get some more, something more to drink. I can see. Um, vocal tics. You said mm -hmm. your son was making up words. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering about those that swear. So is do is it? Um, I thought when I was you know years ago, I thought it was to meant to shock. So a person would swear in the language that they speak. <clears throat> I mean, you wouldn't see somebody swearing in Swahili or something like that. Well, unless they heard somebody swearing in Swahili and they didn't know what it said and it became a tick. Because one of the things that happens is they can be quite suggestible. So they could hear something. And that's where kids might acquire a swearing tick is they hear a swear word on the playground or on a bus. And one of the things that makes it worse is they know that they're not supposed to say it and they can't help it. And oh, it, so it is the it is the need or yeah. to say the bad word. So if they thought, well, like in Britain, I guess bloody is a bad word. Right. Whereas my kid, my kids never had the swearing tick. Only about 10% of people diagnosed with Tourette syndrome uh, exhibit the swearing tick. And don't forget, it might be here one week and it might be gone another unfortunately it's usually the ones that they want to get rid of the painful ticks you know the really severe head ticks uh, my son had a tick where he was going like this and his whole arm got very very sore yeah. so the, the, those are the ones that tend to stay unfortunately because you, you know you want them to go away but they don't tend to not go away so it's not everybody that has Tourette syndrome has the swearing tick but if they do have it, it can cause quite a problem. I know I, I had to go into a school to talk to the teachers about a kid who had a swearing tick in a Catholic school system. I oh, found public I school systems were usually pretty good, uh, but to, to give them credit, they listened to me and they at one point interrupted me and said, so what you're saying is this kid can't help it. And I said, yeah, I can't. So, so what do we do about it? You educate the students. So they brought me back in and we educated, we talked to the students. So this is, you know, just because he's doing it doesn't mean you can do it. He can't help it. This is the disorder. We did an empathy exercise and it was, it, uh, it resolved the issue. So the stress level goes down for the kid because he's not being picked on anymore. He, the, the teachers are no longer getting mad at him for swearing in class. They're no longer putting him in detention for something he can't control. So yeah, you know, it, made, it makes a huge difference to these kids, just the education. Oh. I actually had a parent once who had a, a daughter who had the swearing tick. And by the way, three times more likely in boys than girls, but girls still can get it. And girls tend to exhibit more obsessive compulsive uh, symptoms uh, and less ticks, but that's not always true. They can have very severe ticks as well. But this one little girl, she had a swearing tick for um, that was of concern to the school, but it was repl she repl replaced a, an even worse one. She had a spitting tick, so she was spitting all over the place. A spitting tick. Yeah, so it's not that unusual. And, oh my uh, gosh! I'm just, I'm just uh, yeah. COVID. Oh, well, exactly. Could you imagine? Uh, no. I, I know of one student who had the spitting tick and the class got uh, really involved and one of the problems with the spitting tick was he had to spit on somebody, which is not acceptable behavior. So what they did is they came up with some solutions. They talked as a class and made sure he was okay with it because if he's, it's not going to work for him, the kid will let you know. And so they had to find something that would work with the kid and they made a cutout of a famous person he hated. And I don't remember who it was. Let's just say Justin Bieber because he's Canadian. <laughs> and, and they made this big cutout 
and he would spit on the cutout. And he thought it was great. Of course, the, the class thought it was funny. And, you know, so it just, oh, wow. it, it brings down the anxiety. He's accepted. He can't help it. And eventually, hopefully that tick went away. Uh, but wow, you know, what a good solution. Isn't it a good, it's very creative. And that's, you know, due to very creative teachers, a creative classroom and accepting classroom and education. So if kids know that this is not purposeful behavior. They're very, very accepting and it can stop bullying in its tracks. I've been thanked many times for going into classrooms and educating students and the bullying went from severe and the kid was crying to the kid being accepted by their peers, coming up to them saying, now I understand why you do those things. And uh, you know, it wow. makes me cry, right? So it's, it's been a very, very gratifying job to be able to go in as a volunteer. I bet. Classrooms. So now, is it hereditary? Because obviously you have several. Yeah, I have two, yeah. They, I, I mean, they don't 100% know, but they're pretty sure that there's a genetic component. component. And uh, I was explained, I don't know, this is many years ago, so maybe things have changed, but I was explained by a, a psychologist who, a PhD psychologist who had tried himself, that it was a dominant recessive gene. So stop blaming your spouse because it comes from both sides. So, oh. <laughs> darn it. I know. Oh, I, you know, I had a tick growing up. I had a nose tick where I would twitch. And, uh, you know, I kind of have a thing right now where I clench my thighs, but that's it. You know, I don't really have any vocal so ticks. What's the difference between a habit, a nervous oh. habit, or a, because I used to always go like this. Where I I oh. I'm my nose. Yeah, yeah. But I don't think it was a tick. I think it was just. So how do you how do you know the difference between one and the other? Um, I think a habit would be like you know you know moving your foot. You know how everyone moves their butt. Oh yeah, they tick. They yeah, but it could be a tick too. So the dividing line is is uh, is very unclear, and. Recognize also that Tourette syndrome is not the only tick disorder. There's lots of tick disorders out there. So uh, about 40% of kids will have a tick at some point in their development. It's just their brain, you know, chemicals are just not quite where they should be in their development. And it causes a tick for maybe two months, maybe six months, maybe for the rest of their life. They may have one tick for the rest of their life. And that's not Tourette syndrome. It's just... Uh, they might probably have a name for it, but I don't know what it is. <laughs> so there's lots of other tick disorders out there. They might just have motor tics. That's not Tourette syndrome. So that's the only way I can say it. And where it goes from a habit to a tick, it can happen. Uh, so, and that's, uh, you know, we all scratch mosquito bites. And this is maybe more on the obsessive compulsive scale, but my son would scratch mosquito bites and then not stop. And then he would dig holes in his skin. So it became an obsessive compulsive behavior. It sort of would go over that border of just scratching a mosquito bite, which we all do, to becoming a problem because he could get an infection on his arm from this big hole. I mean, he had holes. He's got scars up and down his arm. He doesn't do it now, but he does. He has scars up and down his arm and his legs from, from when he, he did this. So is it more, it sounds like, it sounds to me more like it's more behavioral to, to um, calm it or to help it than medication. Is that, is medication used necessarily oh, yes. for helping? Um, my oldest and my youngest both have medications, but it wasn't for the ticks because the ticks, except for when the, the, the painful ones weren't that bad, um, especially once we explain to people that they have Tourette syndrome because uh, one of the things that they can do too is complex ticks. So they, they, they will say whole sentences that are out of context. And so it can sound kind of strange that like my youngest son would run up to people and instead of saying hello, would say, I like chocolate milk. Everyone thought it was cute because he was only seven, but you know, it's out of context. And you know, so it's really important to explain to people. So that's that behavioral component. Uh, what was treated for them was their severe anxiety and phobias and OCD. Uh, my youngest son had such severe anxiety, he was afraid of everything. So we uh, went through uh, cognitive behavioral therapy and exposure and response therapy. And he, he did really well with just that until he hit puberty. He hit puberty and things just got worse. And that's very typical. The tics will get worse. The obsessive compulsiveness will get worse. 
sleep disorder, all of it. ADHD tends to get worse during the puberty times. And so he was medicated in that time for severe anxiety. And my oldest son, same thing happened. We were doing really well with strategies. He hit puberty and the wheels fell off and we, we had to have medications. Now his wasn't so much uh, severe anxiety. His were more obsessive compulsive and phobic. He was extremely, if there was a paperclip in the room, he couldn't go in the room. Paperclip? Yeah, anything metal, like keys, paperclips. He couldn't eat with uh, regular utensils. He had to have plastic utensils for a time. And so we had to, just to go overcome that with exposure therapy and alone was too much. So we added in the medications and then he was able to get through it with extensive exposure and response therapy in house, as well as uh, in an office with a psychologist who was, uh, that was his specialty essentially, was exposure and response. Yeah. That is so interesting. What in the world? How? And where does it come from? We don't know. It just kind of happens. And what, what happens is it grows slowly and you give into it a little bit because, of course, we didn't really know about it. And if you give into it, it gets worse and worse and worse. And so we learned, we've learned that it's really, really important to not give in to these urges and to, to sort of redirect. And uh, he also had a phone phobia. And it's really fun. The psychologist... To get over that, he made him call. So we, anytime we ordered pizza, anytime we were on the phone, we would make our son do it and we would reward him for his successes. So reward is a big part. That's another myth, not rewarding your kids. No, you should reward your kids. Of course, reward them meaningfully. And yeah. you don't have to, they don't have to be uh, very expensive. Like go, go out for an ice cream or, you know, video time or watch a movie. So we had an ex extensive reward program in place uh, and we, he would phone the pizzas and eventually we knew that he finally got over his phone phobia when the psychologist was able to get him to make a prank call. <gasps> so, <laughs> that was his biggest fear, right? His biggest fear was saying something wrong. So he in, made him intentionally say something wrong and he phoned up this random business and said, but, um, you know, I'm calling from such and such zoo and I was wondering if you've seen an emu running down the road. <laughs> so, so and we knew, hey, we've reached success. He was able to finally do it. So that was the goal. We had a goal. Oh, that we're is gonna do this. We're going to do this very, very slowly. And a, a year later, he was able to make a crank call. So this is not overnight. It takes time. It took medication and behavioral therapy. So anybody who's getting a crank call out there, it may be. It may be my son. <laughs> saying, Yay, just his crank call. I'm going to have to remember that. Rob Palmer asked, does, mis does mispronouncing common words indicate it? Oh, it can, but it doesn't mean it's Tourette syndrome. Uh, so it. I wonder if he's saying that because it's me, because I can't. Ah! I have a feeling Rob is doing it just to be funny. I think he's right because, uh, and I'm I'm bad too, especially with names. But I do laugh. I love it when you try and speak French. <laughs> <laughs> I can't speak French. Spanish, Spanish, okay. I. Spanish really well until I retired and then stopped speaking Spanish. But boy, I love Spanish. It's it's so great. And I think partly the reason why I have so many problems mispronouncing things is because I read so much and I am am a, fa a fast reader. I've never really slowed down long enough to look at the word to see how. It's uh oh. Yeah. So, cat, cat alert, cat alert, shove something off. <laughs> my dog did that last night later. but uh, really thank funny. you hamilton for breaking that up but um the um yeah I, i'm a lousy speller because i've never really looked at words and i'm i'm really pretty good at those games you play where um you know some of the some of the letters are missing and you have to guess things i just go zoom through it really quick oh hold on a second my son just showed up Man, he, he, I told him, I told him I was going to do this today, but I also told him that I have grapes. I have, the grapes are, are in, and um, I have conquered grapes. And so he says, I'll be over there in the morning. And I thought he was joking. <laughs> I said, well, I'm doing something at 10. So they're going to go out into my backyard probably right now and raid the grapes. 
And uh, if there's any tomatoes out there, I know his girlfriend's going to be all over them because he loves, she just absolutely adores all the tomatoes we have. But I don't think there's a lot. So I just Sounds told nice. Um, anyway, I can't pronounce things well. I think also because I am so more likely to read and I don't listen to I mean, this other thing. Ah, oh, do not stop. I uh, don't hear it. I just yep. read it. So I'm, I know how, I know what that word is in my mind. Yeah. yeah. So that, that is not Tourette's Rob. Uh -huh. No. <laughs> nice try, Rob. <laughs> and he says, I can't believe that you said that. <laughs> <laughs> you put it up on the chat. I'm going to read it. <laughs> it's just the way it is. <clears throat> um, I don't see them here yet. And I don't know why they didn't come on in, but I think they're afraid to come in the house <laughs> because we are in quarantine here. And um, anyway, so the other things I want to know are, okay, so we talked about the swearing. So don't get to the OCD part yet, because that's, mm. that's a whole kind of different thing. It, it kind of interweaves, about. but yeah. Right, right. So uh, probably shouldn't have been so Yes, I'm, yes. <clears throat> um, hold on, you guys. In the backyard. And get your grapes. Okay. Everybody come over and get your grapes. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately, oh. going with the swearing thing, unfortunately on TV, they've, uh, they've promoted that myth because if you, you watch Dr. Phil or Oprah Winfrey, when they have people with Tourette syndrome on, it's, they usually have a swearing tip, or they always have a swearing tip, I think. Really? So yeah. I'm, I'm Oliver Sacks. I've read yeah. almost all of his books, some of them many times. Um, I'm actually just now reading his book on his uh, biography. It's oh. called, um, it's on a book on tape. So I haven't been, I haven't been as good as I should be, but his book, Oliver Sacks, S-A-C-K-S, you guys, he just recently died. Yeah. And um, his book, Um, he talks a lot about, uh, he's, a, he's a neurologist, right? Correct, uh, yeah. That's his expertise. And he, mm -hmm. he's the person who wrote the book Awakening. Correct. Awakening. And he is the person who has, um, uh, so the movie that you saw, Awakenings, with Robin came, Williams. Robin Williams was amazing. That yeah. No comedy in it at all. No. Nope. And Robin Williams did a really great job. But Robin Williams did. I mean, but the, but the movie Awakenings is very different from the book. Yes. Um, but they're both really great to watch. Um, it's these people who have had some, was it like a flu-like symptom? Some, mm -hmm. I, you know what? I think this would be really interesting to rewatch again. Some people have this virus. Especially with the pandemic. Yeah. It was the, wasn't it the, the, the Spanish flu that caused No, it? I don't think so. It was, Something, it was a different one? Yeah. I, I have to, it's so long ago that I read it or watched it. Oh, somebody did ask. Okay, so here's a question they asked is, oh yeah, they're putting this word in here. Are they putting this word in here to mess me up because I can't pronounce it? Trich trichotillomania related to Tourette. More OCD, I believe. Okay. That's pulling the hair out, right? I don't know. I've never heard this word. I believe before. so. I have not heard of that word, but it's something mania. Is it related to Tourette? Yeah, it probably is more of an OCD. It's more of an OCD, but uh, it certainly isn't that unheard of with the Tourette diagnosis. Um, okay, so I was going with Oliver Sacks. So he had written a, 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 one of his books, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Yes. He, he, yes, that is the title. The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. Yeah. Um, I read it many times, but there's case studies in there. Yes. And one of them is a man who has severe Tourette's Correct. and he um, ended up going on some sort of medication. He was an adult. He was having a lot of trouble keeping his work to be able to um, function. People didn't understand this. I think it was like in the 1970s right. and he was having a lot of problems with that. And so what he did is, um, but he found that when he was off his medication and when he was a full on blown out experiencing the Tourette's full force. He was fun. He had a blast. He had so much fun and people liked him. 
So what he was doing, at least this is according to Oliver Sacks, is he would go on some sort of medication Monday through Friday so he can go through his work. He wasn't yeah. screaming at people or yelling at people or whatever he was doing. And then on the weekends, he would let off his medication and then he'd be himself yeah. <laughs> and then go back on his medication. And that's but always I, I the problem with medication is there's side effects usually. My kids basically slept on the medications. My oldest son fell asleep at a chemistry final exam. Oh no! Uh, yeah, that was. Because, but it, it, it was allowing him to get through the exam. So what do you do? It's it's really hard. Uh, none of my kids right now are on medication, much for that same reason because they feel better when they're not on medication, and you know, they've grown up and learned to deal with it, and to they've learned strategies that help them cope, and they know that if things get worse, they can get help. And I think that's really important as well, because we never know with Tourette syndrome what's going to happen. Right. And, you know, I have a, a friend who has a very unusual case of Tourette syndrome. It's extremely severe. He's one of the few, and, and this does happen, where they went through puberty, it got worse, and then it, it's, it's actually, as he's gotten older, gotten worse and worse and worse. And he can't work, except from home now. Oh. Uh, and so he edits comic books. And, you know, so he's, he's found something he can do at home, but it can be very painful because his tics are very, very physical and painful. And where he hits himself, so if he has a, I've got a calculator here, but pretend it's a remote control and he's watching TV, he'll start hitting his head with the remote control because he has a tic. That, and so then he has to put a pillow on his head because he can't control the, the, the tic. And that's his way of not getting hurt. It, it's, it's, you know, and anybody who says this is a choice just needs to go and talk to Steve because they can see nobody would want to go through that. And, you know, kids who are swearing or kids who are spitting or kids who are just having unusual behavior, which is more my kid's case, you know, they're not doing this for attention. In fact, they don't want the attention. They don't want this to happen. And it can be really wow. devastating. Wow, and, you know, um, and my and Steve wasn't diagnosed till he was thirty six, which is more typical of my generation, right? Because doctors just weren't aware of it. So medica so okay, medication can help. Mm -hmm. Behavioral. Oh, and I was going to say about medication. I do not believe now. This may be not the most up to date, but as far as I know, there is no medication specifically for ticks. They tend to use other medications that they've noticed. Hey. If they take this medication, it reduces the number of ticks. So th something like ADHD med medication, which is a stimulant, can make ticks worse. worse. So if you have a, st a student or a kid or an adolescent who has ADHD plus the ticks and they're treating for the ADHD, we can expect that there's a good probability the ticks will get worse. Mm -hmm. So there's that trade-off again. And you know there are some that don't. But uh, it, it, it's, it's a much smaller group of medications. So it's tricky. How about foods and diet? Well, I think a good diet is good for anybody. And there's not a lot of evidence, as far as I'm aware, that changing foods will actually have any effect on ticks. Except maybe caffeine. I think caffeine is one that, you know, it's a stimulant again. So anything that's a stimulant could make ticks a little bit worse. So in fact, I was just reading about that uh, in my Bible, my Tourette syndrome Bible, which is, it's a big book. Oh, gee. There we go. <laughs> and yeah, I think it said in there that caffeine was about the only food or drink that is of concern. But a good diet, of course, is always good. And you, you know, and you wanna be physically active, just like- Yeah, you said to be, to be active physically, not only, helps you as an outlet to get your Tourette's out, I guess, or whatever. It, it just and helps just, generally. And you also are calming yourself and you're physically tiring yourself, I guess. Yeah, exactly. Does it, um, does it get it out? Does that make sense? I mean, like if you were to go, if you have Tourette's <clears throat> and you were to go on a walk somewhere totally by yourself and you could let it all hang out, yeah. Does that help? I mean, it can, yes. And that's one of the strategies that some schools use and some students prefer because they they don't want to, especially in junior high, they don't want to do some of the rear kicks. 
So one of the strategies they will have is they'll have a safe room that they can go to and just let it all out. And it might be a counselor's room, it might be a principal's office, it might be a library, wherever. They, they predetermine a place that these kids can go. So that is a strategy that is used and it is helpful. And, but you know, you, you have to have understanding teachers that, you know, they just give a signal, okay, go. And you don't want to make a big deal about it, right? Otherwise they start to feel badly about it. But yeah, it can help. You know, that is definitely a strategy. Uh, and, and I know uh, one of the times we want to go to a movie and of course, if you have a kid and at that time, Graham had this really high, I can't even do it, very high pitch squeak, very loud. Uh, and he really wanted to go see this movie, but he knows he can't do that take in the middle of a movie. It's gonna to be too disruptive to everybody. And so he can hold it in for the rest of the movie, but then his facial tics are going, they're worse. Yes, you know, so all his other tics came out at, while he was watching the movie. And then afterwards, of course, he's squeaking like a mouse. Crazy, crazy. <laughs> so, well, you know, wasn't he, he involved in the movie enough that it, it helped him not to have the tics because he's so engrossed in the movie? Or, or did, was it the anxiety of, I'm going to let this out right here in the... Yeah, I guess it's, it'd be like it's a the fart. fear. You're yeah. walking a fart and you and then, know you got to do it. And yeah. You don't. Um, and so what do you focus on? You focus on that. Okay. Right? So now that makes sense. A fart or a sneeze. That makes sense. Yeah. Now it's like clear in my head. Okay. <laughs> We're all or, or, right? or, a, or a mosquito bite, right? You've got a mosquito bite and you're told not to itch it. What do you think about yeah. it? Right? So it's the same thing. Right. He's been told not to do that squeak. Right. And, uh, and, and yeah, when he started relaxing and getting into the movie, most likely his tics, you know, I can't remember it was a long time ago, but most likely his tics would have gone down, but it's possible he could have had more tics all the way through. That's, that's totally possible. Very interesting. Very interesting. I hear somebody trying to get in the door. <laughs> yeah. and, and another, another <laughs> thing that's um, a myth with Tourette's syndrome is that you can always tell when somebody has it. If you met my oldest son right now, you probably wouldn't even realize it because his tics are so mild. But if you watch, you can see them. You have to know what to look for. And, you know, he'll do things like this every once in a while. Just a little. But we all do something. You exactly. Know, like I do the of my glasses and things like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. Except that, you know, this is kind of a, a little bit different, right? <laughs> so he'll just be talking to you and do that kind of thing. But so you have to kind of know, but it's not really obvious. And most people that I've met with Tourette syndrome, it's not very obvious until you go to something like a Tourette clinic and everybody has Tourette syndrome and then all the ticks come out because they're quite suggestible. And so when oh. people are ticking, they'll more likely to tick. Kind of like yawns, you know, when one person yawns and everybody else yawns in a room, it's, it's, it's just like that. So you, if you talk to people who go to a Tourette conference, they'll say, I love these, but they're so exhausting because my ticks get worse. Okay, now Rob has an interesting one. I don't know if this is, Tourette's, but he says, I had a play last year, someone right in front in the front row kept laughing at inappropriate times. A woman was being strangled to death in the play. The rest of us were gasping and uncomfortable for the actors. Could this be Tourette's? Could be, but I, you know, I can't say for sure. I had a very similar experience <laughs> with somebody, I was at the ballet, and there was a guy sitting next to me, and he suddenly shouted up, Asperger's! <laughs> <laughs> just out of the blue and he kept doing this to me like actually hitting me <laughs> so I turned to him in the intermission and I said excuse me you don't mind but do you have Tread syndrome he goes yep <laughs> so we start, started talking I said oh I have a sudden Tread syndrome oh that's cool so yeah um, but could you imagine somebody else sitting there they'd be really really mad but I'm going, nobody. If you're trying to enjoy yourself and here's somebody. <laughs> somebody yelling out Asperger's intermittently and going like this. <laughs> that, you know, and, and what is, how do I say this tactfully? Hi. Um, what is the responsibility of a person who has Tourette's to not to come into a situation that disrupts mm -hmm. the rest of the enjoyment of the room? keeping in mind that they are not doing it on purpose yeah. and maybe they didn't go in thinking that uh, they were going to do it going back to the yeah. person who's sneezing or coughing or farting or whatever there are times in your life where you know that that's going to be accelerated like if you yeah. are coughing a lot 
you have and, a tick. And pills. coughing can be a tick, actually. That's that's uh, that is a, a very very common tick. To go into a room, like mm -hmm. people trying to take a test. Yep. And yeah, of course, it's disruptive to you trying to take the test. Yeah. As the person with Tourette's, that's there's a lot of anxiety. There's also yeah. a lot of people in the room who have anxieties or stress and, yeah, and you're affecting them concentrate on their test yeah. and to have somebody else in the room who's doing something that's distracting how it's not fair to them that's correct yeah so it's not fair to everybody correct so uh, who in, may not be a, used in, to it in a classroom situation it's really easy they just have a testing room they go to they have somebody go in the other room yeah they go they have it usually most schools uh, i haven't been in a school that doesn't have it has separate rooms where they can go to uh, and what, what a lot of people don't recognize is that when you have these diagnoses, it's actually really helpful. I, I haven't got a lot of flack from people saying, why are you labeling your kids? And my, my response was usually to get help. And, you know, it, it gave the teachers an explanation and it gave them strategies and they were grateful for it. Uh, we had great teachers and also the, the principals and counselors tend to give your kids the best fit for the team. For, for the condition, which is a plus, right? I mean, you get these great teachers, but so yeah. And what people don't recognize is that all the way through university, it's actually a human rights issue if you don't give these accommodations. Yeah, so it's a, it's a legal America right. Too, there's certain, if you have the paperwork, have... right? You, 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 and so my, my oldest son, he had his own room for every single test all the way through university. And so he could tick away and, and shout out things if he wanted or say comments, whatever he needed to do, get up, walk around if he needed to do that in the room. And uh, so those accommodations are really important. When you get to something like a theater situation, like we were just talking about with Rob, uh, with the, the, the movie that I took my son to, I think it's really important to not go into those situations because people will get angry. Now, the fellow beside me said that he was drinking a lot of alcohol to try it, because usually if he drinks, his ticks go down. Now, it's also a disinhibition drug, so it can actually make them worse. So I was kind of wondering about that, but I don't know, maybe it does help. And he only said Asperger's at the beginning of each act <laughs> once. And I think he should have said to me right off the bat, I have Tourette syndrome. I'm gonna do my best to be quiet to, to people on both sides. And especially because he was hitting me with his elbow. I think he actually should have said something to right. me so that I had understanding and I mean, apologized. Totally understanding of it. Well, oh, in your case, uh, for sure, but. Uh, yeah, for, because I, I'm aware of it. I was just kind of laughing to myself going, this guy has Tourette's syndrome. Because <laughs> yeah. he's got both the vocal and the moving tick here going on. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I think that that's really important. And that was something that my uh, oldest son early on was how important it was to, he had a, a, he's a really good speaker. He's an amazing speaker, but he had at the time a throat clearing tick. And they quite often come as a response to something else. Like if you have a cold, you know how you clear your throat, <clears throat> cold goes away. So, uh, usually most people, the throat clearing goes away, but with Tourette syndrome, it could be months or even years that they have that tick now of throat clearing. So something starts it and then it just carries on. So he had this throat clearing tick and he had a presentation to make in school. And this was, I think, grade nine or eight. And he had made the decision not to tell the teachers at this time. He was very new in the diagnosis and he just wasn't ready. He was, he, he was embarrassed. He didn't want to tell anybody. And I accepted that from him. But what happened is the teacher docked him marks for being unprepared oh. because he cleared his throat so much. And she misread that as being uh, not prepared for his speech. And he was devastated. He said, Mom, it's my tick. It's, you know, and I said, well, what should we do about it? He said, I think we should tell him. And so we did. We went and told the teacher. Well, then the teacher was embarrassed. She felt terrible for docking him marks for something he had no control over. Right. So it's so important to educate people around you. And you know, not everybody's ready to do that, and I understand that. But I think based on our personal experience, at least, and based on the experiences of 13 years of going into classrooms, it's always better to educate. 
I had a case of a Catholic school system that I went to. I was invited to do professional development several times at their school district uh, down in Okotoks, which is a community south of Calgary. And they had me go into classrooms and they had two track kids, two, I shouldn't say kids, two kids with Tourette syndrome, yeah. <clears throat> excuse me, <laughs> two kids with Tourette syndrome. One who was very open about it, told everybody what it was. He was very popular, people liked him and the other kid would not say, and so he would say these weird things and they just thought he was weird. And their person, you know, this is anecdotal, but it shows side by side, same grade, how different it was. So they brought me in to talk to this other kid who wouldn't say anything, their class. And you could see the light bulbs go on and, they were, and you could hear them in the back saying, oh, I think Johnny might have Tourette syndrome. Oh, that explains so much. <laughs> and even though he didn't come out and say it, the kids, and I didn't say his name, I just talked generally about Tourette syndrome and what it looks like, incorporated a couple of his tics in my presentation, mixed throughout, and it, it changed things for him. So that education, I think, is really, really important. And you're right, they do have a responsibility to make sure that they're not disruptive in situations where people have paid a lot of money for something. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and it came up regarding church too. Uh, we had a, a girl who was swearing and shouting. And what do we do for church? Well, put her in a, you know, in these, this day and age, there's no excuse not to have a, a camera in there for the service and she's in another room and you know I think that's perfectly viable to do then she's still part of the service she can socialize afterwards intermingle but not be right in the service with everybody else because it would be very disruptive so if I you really want to get into the pseudoscience of this year too oh <laughs> but I wanted to say uh, Rob Palmer mentioned in the Joker I guess the film the mm -hmm. character locked uncontrollably and he has a card he gave out to explain it mm -hmm. and um i've heard of that with people who have family who have like some severe um Autism. socially issue yeah. uh, like a and they'll they'll say my my father has alzheimer's you know so yeah. sorry and this yeah and Tourette syndrome it's a common practice especially for severe uh Tourette syndrome and, and if you have a tick right now like there's a, a common one shut up if you say shut up to everybody <laughs> as you're walking down the street, you might want to hand out a card <laughs> or else you might get punched. I'm sorry, this is the way it is. But yeah. Linda, has, Linda Rosa, she's okay. So, so okay, here's, here's, let's start on the pseudoscience end of this. And I'm sure you've heard lots of treatments. And I'm thinking of the church, like you said, that uh, a woman who would be screaming out obscenities in a church maybe thought to she has demons and she's right. possessed and that we would have to try to cast the demons out of her and so on. Linda says, I've been concerned about an abusive quack practice called attachment therapy, which I think Ooh. she's going to be talking to us about on one of these talks uh, in the future. It's highly authoritarian parenting methods. Um, it claims to be effective treatment for several condition, conditions, including Tourette's. Are you aware of this practice or other quack treatments for Tourette's and like I said, Linda's probably going to be talking about this in detail. So if you don't know a lot about it, that we will learn. But a lot that about particular it. one, I don't know. But I think it's also the rebirthing. Oh, oh, yeah. I haven't come across it personally. Thank goodness. Thank goodness yeah. <laughs> but it would but be in more of extreme situations where they're not going to take their child necessarily to some sort of medical professional, but maybe to a a quack or somebody yeah. who's going to say, "Oh, well." They just need to be reborn or you didn't yeah. hold them enough or yeah it's um yeah they it, demons. It's, they have demons it, demons, in it. demons in it. <laughs> i i haven't had any personal experience with that thank goodness i have had instances where people are hesitant to use medication or even go see a psychologist because they feel that they that prayers will be enough and that going to church will be enough and that the counseling through the church is going to help. But it, I've never seen an instance, it's, of course it's anecdotal, I haven't seen an instance where it has helped. And that's really unfortunate. That's where you know, it gets very sad. I've had questions from parents such as, oh, are these homeopathic tick drops, will they work? Have you got any experience with that? Oh my God, and and uh, uh, you know, we had a Facebook page for a time and they were, they were trying to, to say, well, you know, we should be recommending naturopaths. And I said, well, 
as a, an organization, we, we were linked with Trek Canada at the time, we cannot condone this. This is not medically proven. And anything that's not medically, I tried to keep it really neutral. Because, you know, it's... <laughs> <You're> like, <laughs> no, we'd like to recommend things that work. Yes, <laughs> exactly. So Sorry. I certainly had that. And in my Bible here, it actually says that the most common treatments used for patients with stress are the CAM treatments. And people are desperate. Their kids are not doing well. And it's stressful as a parent having these kids that you don't know from one day to the next if it's going to be a good day or a bad day or a terrible day. And it's, I can see why parents reach out. They're so desperate to try anything. And that's what makes me angry. And that's maybe one of the reasons I joined the GSLW, to be honest. Because... <laughs> I joined my Wikipedia project. Yes, exactly. <laughs> because it does make a huge difference. Um, I was going to look up really quick to see how often people are looking at the Wikipedia page for Tourette's. But what I wanted, was thinking about is, you know, if you're in a situation where CAM medicine or CAM alternative medicine, which is alternative to medicine, make sure <laughs> you know what that means. Yeah. Uh, if you think it works, just think of what the phrase is. It's alternative to medicine. So that, um, you know, they probably give a simple, because listening to you tell the story of you and your boys and, you know, what you and your husband had to go through, it does not sound quick. It does not sound easy. It sounds like it was multiple appointments with multiple doctors. Years. You know, in America, you're paying for that. Yeah, you have I can't care. imagine. But I, you know, you're in Canada. They're like, okay, cool. But yeah. people in, in America have, I can't imagine what the bill would be like for that if you had to have constant specialists and yeah. behavioral therapists and possible medication. And if somebody just reaches out and says, here's, here's what here's you do. Do you have a yeah. coffee enema. Yeah. That'll oh, yeah. Care that. yeah. It's, it's, <laughs> that sounds like it would be something people would gravitate towards. Yeah. Because it's simple. It's easy. It's cheap. Of course it's ineffective. Yeah. But maybe and, and somebody somewhere says, Oh, it did. It eased his, his, his threats. His ticks went down a little bit. So it must work. Uh, but, that's the natural, but that's the natural way ticks work. They naturally wax and wane. So they, they go, you know, so it's probably most likely coincidental. They have that cycle and it can be months where they're really good. Uh, and then months where they're really bad or just weeks. Uh, my, my kid was on a three week cycle. I don't know why, but it's, it's a natural occurrence for Tourette syndrome to come and go. I'm looking at the Wikipedia page for Tourette syndrome. This is always so interesting. And I'll put this in the, in the um, I keep wanting to say show notes, but we don't have show notes. And I'll put it in the Facebook page. Anybody who's watching this later on YouTube, um, if you want to, I'm sorry about that. But um, it looks like on a daily average, it receives, the Wikipedia page receives 3,500 page views a day. Um, wow. Over Just in the last day or so, it's received 6,000, almost 7,000 views in one day for some reason so something happened in the news or somebody some some influencer said something about it and people said what's Tourette's and they Billie went, Eilish came out saying she Who? has Tourette's syndrome Billie Eilish the singer oh she said she has Tourette's yeah about when a few did months she ago that? just a couple months ago okay. oh well, this is like in the last day yeah okay well she was just on um the DNC last night or the night before. Oh, so that could be it. Maybe I wonder if she said something about it then. I bet she did. So there's your famous person, a name I couldn't pull out earlier. Very good. Now look, I'm going to, I'm going to look. Billie Eilish. Oh, she, wow. Dang. So <laughs> you guys can't see this, but she was on the Democratic uh, National Convention last night or the night before and her Wikipedia page views are almost consistently 20,000 page views a day. Yesterday or the day before, it is at 160,000 page views in one day. <laughs> Normally 20, just consistently 20, 160, wow. 160,000 in one day because she was on the DNC. People goes, who's that? Who's that? Who's that? And so oh, if she mentioned Tourette's, then that, that would be. mean that's why the Tourette uh, Wikipedia page yeah. views when people said, 
Billie Eilish has Tourette's? Yeah. Zoom with the views. And, and Wikipedia is a really great way of, um, of seeing what people, what's in the news, what's happening. Yeah. So it looks like Tourette's syndrome is, uh, the Wikipedia page is giving a lot of really great advice, 4,000 page views, four, almost 5,000 page views a day. People are getting information off of that, hopefully. And, uh, oh, and Wendy, Wendy uh, Hughes just said, I just looked it up on Wikipedia. <laughs> We're causing it. There you go. We're causing it right now, but, uh, probably in three or four or five. Um, Linda is putting a, an attachment here in the Facebook that about Tourette's uh, parenting attachment attachment therapy for people who have Tourette's. The more education we get out there, as you said, you're going into these schools, and that is amazing and wonderful. And this talk we're having right now is also enlightening people who will understand a little bit more. Of course, we're the people who tend to come to these talks are usually people who are in the scientific world already. They have scientific yeah. thinking, they're skeptics, but um, this is a lot of information I didn't have. I, I, I'm learning a ton from you, Adrian. Good. And uh, this is, this is really interesting. And Janice Boynton also said, this is really fascinating. It, it does tie maybe to towards the facilitated communication world a little bit. We'll see. Um, the next time I talk to Janice, um, the, um, I was going to talk again about, so there, these CAM, and we say, we call it CAM because it's, uh, what does it stand for? Complementary and, uh, and Alternative Medicine. Yeah, Complementary Alternative Medicine. In other words, complementary to, with yeah. alternative medicine that doesn't work, obviously. <laughs> so we say CAM for short, that again, it is something that, that um, is done usually outside of the medical profession, possibly because parents are desperate. Yeah. Um, they don't know any better. Uh, they think their children are being willful uh, yeah. and doing it on purpose yes. and, and on and on. And this is a quick fix. And again, it's uh, inexpensive. Cam, well, of course it doesn't work, but it seems inexpensive. This is what I was gonna say. There is a, I really wanna do some more research on this idea it's a, it's a nun study. Somebody maybe will know what I'm talking about. Uh, and that's why I can't read about it because I can't think of what it's called, but it's this idea that you pray for something and they watch most illnesses wane, you know, and like this. So if you mm -hmm. have an illness, you usually don't go to the doctor day one that you feel the illness you usually wait a little bit and then you go to the doctor at a peak point a certain point at the illness and usually that illness is going to we're not talking like cancer or something we're talking yeah, about, like a flu or something or yeah cold. something that has a come you know uh, mm -hmm. uh fluctuating and they Aching go pain. to the doctor at this point and then it starts to dissipate usually and um they did a study with this with nuns praying for certain kinds of uh, illnesses and they used the bell curve and they looked at this kind of thing. And so that's where I'm thinking this is the same kind of thing. If somebody has a, you're, like I said, I didn't know about this, that Tourette's change over time mm -hmm. and they change their form and sometimes they actually go away ish, mm -hmm. you know, to yep. lesser methods. You can have lesser. a couple months of of relatively no ticks. So if you have seeked out some sort of alternative medicine and you're trying this for the Tourette, um, for the tick, I should say, and it seems to work, it could have just been the natural yeah. uh, cycle of that of that tick where it wanes and, and so yeah. on. And so um, it appears for that to work. So again, it's antidotes. And we, us in the skeptic community and the science community, community, community we, we need to understand that these, this is an effect of looking at studies and looking at, all, uh, looking at antidotes, that you have to have controls. You have to have blinded controls. You yeah. have to have, rep, it has to be repeatable. Rep, re, repeatable. Repeatable, yes. <laughs> Reputable. <laughs> yeah, reputable too. Um, Mark um, Rob Palmer says it's an incess incessory prayer. Uh, oh. and, um, Wendy says post hoc ergo proper. Yeah. 
Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, that's exactly right. We're, yeah. we're, we're the, uh, uh, you think you've had an effect on something because you've done something. Like that's if, correct. If you said, I don't want my children to eat any more bananas, we're going to take bananas out of the diet. And suddenly they seem to get better. Suddenly being an operative word, what is suddenly, um, mm -hmm. they start having yeah. a fix. And then you think it's the bananas that, Taking and it can be quite dramatic. Like, I mean, I've, I remember seeing uh, Graham going, wow, this is great. He's doing great now. But it, it comes back. <laughs> it always comes back. <laughs> really interesting. Okay, so I want to talk pretty quickly. Oh, yeah. So Rob's put up a, a, the Wikipedia page for his intercession. Mm. Saying it right. I want to talk a little bit about OCD. Mm -hmm. we in this this discussion which has been so interesting so OCD from what I understand uh is also one of these things that is it's more commonplace than Tourette's and it is um has all the same actually oh is it really mm -hmm. I thought it's more common and that it is something I think, I think it's about one excessive to to mild depending on people what what uh yeah i'm just going to look up the the incidence of it right now i've got uh, my slides out right now and the so. way it was explained to me and i'm not sure if i heard this from oliver Sacks reading one of his books but oh and the book that i was talking about that is about his life is called on the move he was uh he was constantly on the move with uh motorcycles he just traveled a lot he lived in a lot of places very interesting man yeah, uh, this isn't meant to be a talk on Oliver Sacks, but, it, it was a very <laughs> but we love him, so yeah, it's okay. I absolutely find him fascinating. But OCD, the way it was explained, and if you watch the movie, as good as it gets. Yeah, which is a really interesting um, look at what this is like. Um, so I'm just going to interrupt you for a sec. So yeah, it is a larger percentage, approximately three percent of U.S. Ch uh, U.S. children. So it's a one percent for Tourette and three percent for, for for OCD, and that's for kids. I, I'm talking kids. That's not adult. So from what I understand, okay. So you see, there's a person who is locking a door, mm -hmm. and they go over to the door and they try to lock it. Mm -hmm. A deadbolt, where you just turn it, and in their brain, to the rest of the rest of the population doesn't have OCD. When they lock the bolt and it makes that kind of that clicky sound and you know you mm -hmm. feel it just kind of go into place the deadbolt goes into its spot your brain says locked it's done yeah locked and then you walk away and you go about your day i've locked the door mm -hmm. but to somebody who has ocd in at least in the kind that are checkers yeah they try to lock the door and in their brain, it, it, it may go into the deadbolt and it may lock, mm -hmm. but in their brain, it says not locked, not locked, not locked. And so they have to undo it and try it again, undo it, try it again, undo it, try again, yeah. over and over until finally the brain says locked. And, it, and it's, um, I think Oliver Sacks talks about a person who felt like they were driving on the highway and they thought they hit somebody with their car. Mm -hmm. And so they got off wrong. the off ramp and circled back again and, and parked to look for the body that they hit with their car. Yeah. And they could not grasp that they had not harmed somebody with their car. Yeah. So they kept going back and circling, looking yeah. for the person that they hit with their car. And it, and it you know, gets to a point where you're an hour or two hours late for work until mm -hmm. your brain finally says, I did not hit somebody with my car. Mm -hmm. Um, same with the washing of the hands. You're trying to wash your hands and they don't get the germs washed, off. Or you didn't quite do it right. So yes. so this is, once that got explained to me like that, I kind of got it. Yeah. And I'm a person who does pay attention to a lot of science things and, and so on. So I can imagine to the average world of people who aren't interested in this, how confusing this must be and how mm -hmm. absolutely odd this looks i think uh, oliver Sacks has a book called the boy who would not stop washing his hands right yeah so talk about ocd a little bit and what yeah. is happening there well some of it can be just that it's not unlocked unlocked but it can also be more almost like a superstition so that if i don't lock and unlock the door 20 times 
my mother will die or a plane will crash into the building or something bad will happen to my dog. It could be any of those things. With Tourette's syndrome, it's less likely to be that. And that's actually quite common. The, and that's what causes the anxiety, these bad thoughts. And they know they're irrational, but they can't help it. And the thoughts persist. Uh, and with Tourette's syndrome, it's more of a feeling of, I'm going to turn the lock until it feels right. So there's multiple ways it can exhibit itself. But how do we determine, like, I, I know of people who have gone to check the door twice. Well, we don't call that obsessive compulsive because that's a normal, okay, did I lock it or not? You so know, that's that. That's pretty you do normal. a lot of, you can't remember. Yeah. yeah, and you can even do it three times. It's not a big deal. It's not going to take you hours. It's when it starts interfering with your life that that's when the diagnosis is necessary. So as you say, if you're two hours to work late, late to work every day, that's an issue. And most likely if it goes unchecked, it will become three hours, four hours, five hours until you can't go to work at all because you're spending the whole day. Uh, with the, the lock. Uh, and that's a very visible one. What people don't understand with obsessive compulsive tendencies is that they can be very hidden as well. They can be just a thought. You know, that's the obsession part, not the compulsion. What you described was the compulsive action. So the obsessive part can be quite hidden. I have a, an example of uh, a teacher in, in the U.S. who said when she was growing up, she, uh, she had Tourette syndrome and OCD. And she was in, she called it the Bluebird Reading Group. Do you remember those reading groups? You were in the good yeah. the reading group. And then, and uh, she was a great reader. And she developed a compulsion that after every three words, she had to count to 20. So you can imagine in how mind, slow, or? in her mind, mm -hmm. in her mind. So nobody, the teachers had no clue that this was happening. And so she would read three words, count to 20, read three words. You can imagine it slowed down her reading. And she, she's quite a funny lady. And she said, and then I ended up moving down to the buzzard level because they thought I couldn't read suddenly, which, you know, in retrospect, you think, how could teachers think that? But they don't know. And they, they, they were trying, you know, they probably did all kinds of things to try and figure out what was going on. And kids don't always know how to explain it. So if you, you know, so they don't know that it's not normal. Yeah, and so I tell teachers, if you suddenly see a kid who's performing well, not performing very well, you need to look at why that is. It's not going to be a learning disability because they could do it before. Mm -hmm. So something else is going on and it could be something like this. So it can be quite hidden, but just as detrimental to, to learning. Mm -hmm. And um, so, yeah, there's always the two components, usually with the, the obsession and then the compulsion to do something. And it's, it can be very, very uh, disabling. And as I say, if you don't get it treated, it tends to get worse. And we certainly saw that with our kids because my oldest son didn't get treatment until he was in junior high, mm. just because we didn't get a diagnosis until then. My youngest son had treatment starting age four and it was a lot easier except for yeah puberty, puberty was just as bad <laughs> but I'm telling you just having a place to go and he was diagnosed with OCD at age four which is quite unusual it's very very young but uh you know the symptoms were there for sure and you know he checked all the boxes quite often with Tourette syndrome they call them obsessive compulsive tendencies they don't quite tick all the box for full-blown OCD, but it's still detrimental enough that they, their functioning is impaired. So, you know, there is some slight differences between uh, OCD with Tourette syndrome and OCD with a person who does not have Tourette syndrome. But they're, 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 it's more about the reason that they do the thing. As I say, they flip a light switch 20 times uh, or else my teacher will die right in front of me. Wow. Uh, I actually, when you're talking about the body, I have an interesting story because you know, people will say, well, they could just stop it. Apparently <laughs> well, not. No. So I, I know this Are story from, from Frank McMaster here at the University of Calgary Children's Hospital, and he's a, a neuroscientist, and he had talks about a case of a kid in here locally who was diagnosed with obsessive compulsive disorder, and, and his parents... Anytime they had a bump, he would get out and check to make sure, just like you're talking about. So he would make sure, okay, it's not a body, so we can keep going. And one day they were late to something. So they 
went over a bump and the, he, the kid's freaking out saying, we have to stop, we have to check, we have to check. And I said, oh, we just don't have time, we can't do it. And he actually jumped out of the moving car because he oh, was no. so compelled to check that his brain said, I need to check more than I need to be safe. So anybody who says that, yeah, you could just stop it on your own, doesn't have a true understanding of what's happening. Wow. He's okay. He was okay. But, you know, that's scary, right? Can you imagine the parents? <laughs> no, so, I can't at all. So um, that's how strong these urges can be. And like my son with the picking behavior, he knows that it can cause affection. He knows it's not a good thing to do, but he can't stop it. He used to bite off his fingernails and then bite off the tips of his fingers. My oldest used to do the fingernail thing all the way down to the bone of it, you know, just as far down. Yeah, as far, bone. yeah, that's not unusual, but did he take the fingertip tops off? No, I don't think so. That's, that's called going too far. That's, that's, <laughs> you make them bleed. I thought the biting the nails down to the, almost not having nails was bad, but. Uh, yeah. So as I say, all these conditions, there's, you know, there's a spectrum. You could say, and then people will say this all the time, right? Oh, it's my OCD. You know, talking and about I do, and I'm wondering, is that offensive? Because I don't know if I have OCD. I, I have all kinds of things that just make me uncomfortable. Yes. And that's, that's probably the worst. It's obviously not interfering in my life. And it's yeah. not um, nothing of that sort. But I find that there are certain things that I want this way. Like whenever I see somebody who's joined Zoom and their name is not correct, spelled, or like, you oh, know, they have change a, mine? No. no, no, yours is fine. <laughs> I look, but like if they don't alphabetize <laughs> one of the letters correct, you know, the first letter, or they have two letters capitalized, wrong, you know, or something like that, I must fix that. And mm -hmm. I feel better once it's done, because it's done, but I don't think that OCD. No, it, I don't think that. that? It's just perfectionism, and there's nothing wrong with that. In fact, I'm not, no, I'm not a perfectionist. <laughs> not. Well, it, it, in that respect, you are, but it's it's actually a good trait to have. It is some sub level of perfectionism. We want that. We want good work, right? We want to have precise work. We want to have um, work without too many errors. So that's a good trait. But when when we start, say, I mean, maybe you can look at me a little bit here how long it takes me to do an article, a Wikipedia article. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> it's not that bad. But if, if I've got a paragraph to write and that paragraph takes me five weeks to write it, that's a okay. problem. I if see. it takes you two hours to write it, that's not a problem. If it takes you a day to write it, it's still probably not a problem. But if it takes, and you're spending all day, every day writing that paragraph, that's a problem. And that's more like what my kids were experiencing. They had, uh, and one of the big things for written assignments for OCD is getting started because if it's not perfect in their head, it's not going on the paper. And so they, they had to do a lot of exercises with regards to just writing gibberish. And it's very, very hard for kids with obsessive compulsive tendencies or perfectionistic tendencies to write wrong answers pur purposely. And so, that's what they, my kids had to do. Well, I feel like it's a comfort more yeah. than a feeling of um, perfection or having it right. I mean, it could be something nobody would ever noticed. Who would care? And everybody it has just their own me. I just feel yeah. like I need to, or if I saw somebody in the store, now this might have something to do with my, uh, I was a photographer for a very long time. We didn't have Photoshop. And so you had to get it right. And you yeah. had, it was on film. So you didn't get to take nine frames. No. Took the picture, you moved to the next one. You didn't get to keep messing with. So I was very detailed. Like I would say, this piece of hair right here needs to go like right there. And this piece of lint needs to come off. And this yeah. needs to, I mean, it was very, very detailed. And I, that might've just been a thing through my career. Mm -hmm. Whereas, um, like if I see somebody at the store, well, back in the day when we could stand closer to people, <laughs> I didn't mind if they had lint on the back of their jacket or something, I would do my best to try to get that off as carefully as I possibly could and take it off without them noticing it. You're going over the edge a little bit there. <laughs> <laughs> but it was like they have this perfectly nice back of their jacket with this yeah. white lint on it. And 
bothered me so much to get that darn thing off or a collar that just was up yeah. like this. I mean, that's not yeah. going to bother anybody but me. Yeah. I don't know how much that is photography wise. A little bit of that. It's easy really it, right? That's when the lock on the necklace is like this. Even now, yeah. if I'm, this would, this would freak me out. I would not be comfortable until I have fixed that. By My, yourself, uh, but would you fix it on me? Oh, if absolutely. I, I, okay. I wouldn't no. touch you. <laughs> I wouldn't touch you. I would say, oh, okay. I would say, Adrian, you look um, you look fabulous. I love the necklace with your outfit, but your lock on your necklace is right here. Maybe pull it back in the back. I would tell you that I mean, <laughs> you're. Oh, I, I'm sure you're not aware of it, but your necklace lock has slipped here. And then when you, whenever you fix, I say perfection that looks great now so here's an exercise for you because this is sort of what my kids went through and it will give you an understanding <laughs> next time you have that urge don't give into it and see how it feels but people always told me and janice is saying the same thing to me right now she's you did that to me at psychon with a big smiley <laughs> face but but to be fair i am i it people don't realize that they have like a piece of stuff in their teeth oh, that, yeah, or, they have, or they yeah. have like their thing you know I remember yeah. photographing somebody once uh she was doing a talk and we were videotaping her and she had pie or something on her shirt and nobody said anything to her and then the video comes out and she's got this piece of pie like a whipped cream right there or something why didn't anybody tell me well we didn't want to embarrass you oh well fine you let me go through the whole video with this piece of pie on me it's like <laughs> So when, as a photographer, people were constantly telling me, thank you for noticing that. Thank yeah. you for fixing that. Thank you for doing but that. But if you're talking who about- Who wants to walk around in public with toilet paper on their shoe? Or I agree. Or lipstick on their be. teeth, you know? It's like, just quietly, politely tell me so that I can fix it. So I hate to tell you this, Susan, but people with obsessive compulsive disorder, now I'm not saying you have this. This is just a, more of a joke. They are very good at rationalizing why they do things. <laughs> and I got a lot of feedback from people who told me they love that uh, yeah. that I but, would you know, do if that you're because talking about I was looking at them. I take I'm going to take your picture, yeah. and I'm I'm I would look them head to toe, and they would and I would fix and I taught every one of my photographers fix something even if there's nothing to fix. Right, fix something even if you you don't turn go over and touch them unless of course they're okay with that. But you would say right here. Can you just go like this? Right here. But if you're talking here. about you're standing in a lineup in a super in a now that is store. different. Okay, yes. okay, yeah, that is so different. that that no you no leave that lint, leave that lint alone. <laughs> Nowadays we're six feet away from them, so how can yeah. I reach it? Hey, you have a piece of lint on the back of your jacket. If you get it off, it's bothering me. I'm all part of the so that's I'm the one I'm talking about. So those life. are the ones you're going to leave. But that, that's exactly the treatment is you just don't give in and you have strategies. There's breathing techniques and there's uh, way, you know, comedy. There's, yeah. With my mask on at the grocery store. And, and I'm, I'm breathing because of not of the mask, but because I want to leave the lint on you. <laughs> and, and what's really counterintuitive, and this is something that was really interesting for me, and I'm maybe straying away from OCD a little bit now and getting into just generalized anxiety. But uh, my, my youngest son, when he was afraid of anything, so one of the problems we had was if our alarm clock didn't go off, and in those days when electricity went off, the alarm clock would go off, we would be late for school. And the, when with obsessive compulsive tendencies, you can't interrupt anything. You have to start from the beginning. You can't all of a sudden jump right in halfway through something. You have to make everybody go back to the beginning. And uh, my son used to do that practicing his guitar. If he made a mistake, he'd go back to the beginning. So he got really good at playing the beginning and not very good at, <laughs> at his mistakes. So that's very mistake. I must go back yeah. and all over again. So we actually, with the school, practice being late with our son. And so, you know, you think that's kind of a weird. It's very counterintuitive. No, but you have to face your fear. So that's what we would do is, is we would say, we're going to practice being late. And the very first day, he was in grade two. He was screaming. He screamed from 10 o'clock because we, we discussed with the school the best time to come in because they knew it was going to be a problem. And they said 10 o'clock is good. Everything's quiet by then. And he screamed until noon. And then the principal called me and said, we, help. <laughs> He's crying. <laughs> <laughs> so I talked to him. We had a reward set up. We had a, got to have a little Lego thing. So I reminded him about the reward. Well, he stayed. He didn't go into class. He just stayed in the office until the end of the day. But that was a success because he went late. And the next day, 
he didn't cry as much. And then they were able to get him into the resource center, not into the classroom, but in with the resource teacher. The third day, they were able to get him into the classroom and he spent the rest of the day. And the fourth day, and this is how, it doesn't happen this fast always, but we were very lucky. And the fourth day he said, hey mom, I wanna practice being late. I'm reading this book and it's really good. So I knew he won. <laughs> So, and we never had an issue again. And do you have to keep rewarding? No, you just reward until they get over their fear and then, and then we're done. The other thing that was really interesting, and I argued with the psychologist a lot, is uh, because he couldn't have his door closed at night, he had to sleep in our room, he was afraid of every noise. We had to be in the room with him when he's brushing his teeth because he was so afraid. So he, <laughs> And this is a very condensed version, so don't take this as being the, the whole treatment. It was very involved and it lasted many months and it was very gradual. But I'll just sort of summarize very quickly. The prescription was to watch horror films. <laughs> and I said to the psychologist, in what parenting book does it tell you to watch horror films? <laughs> and he said, no parenting book. And I went, so why should I do this? And he pulled a book of studies on 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 his shelf, opened up the page and said, here. <laughs> and uh, I went, oh, okay. <laughs> so we, we tried it. And he, he, we, it was hard to find horror films for a seven-year-old that didn't have a lot of like sex. Oh, Wizard of Oz. Wizard of Oz. <laughs> no hands down. That is the scariest freaking movie of all time. It's still CSI. Mm -hmm. CSI. We started watching CSI. Oh. Wow. Because there's all sorts of gruesome stuff in there, right? And he was freaked out. That's not scary like like Wizard of yeah, Oz. It's not <laughs> terrifying, man. I still have Freddie well, Krueger treatment, Robin, Robin Canton says. What's that? The Freddie Krueger treatment. Oh, yes. So, yeah. So, we did find a couple movies that were, were very scary, actually. And, and the therapist said, as soon as you find something that really freaks him out, you stop. Uh, until he's ready to go again and then you play the movie but where you had to stop the next day while he's playing you keep playing it over and over again and it was true eventually he, Troy just said to me oh you can stop now I'm done I, I'm not scared of it anymore and within six months he was a different kid and the school was like what did you do with him because he was a kid who would we should have the scary movies. <laughs> yeah. who knew isn't that counterintuitive I, you know, that's, this is where... The, well, we the can't always protect our children. No. At a certain point, you have no. to, they're going to beat, hit the wide world and... Yeah, and, and one part of the conversation dying. was, how realistic is this, that this is going to happen to you? So that's part of our, our you know, what are the odds that this is going to happen to you? So, and, and lots of breathing, and, and so it's really exposure therapy. And the, six months later, he was a different kid, and the school... Isn't this true, age, though, with most age. children? Raising most children, it seems like I'm 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 identifying with a lot of this. Yeah, and I can't I can't really talk about what I would do with my kids because they may be listening to me right now. And I don't <laughs> have the permission to talk about it, but I think a lot of people would identify with what you're saying, and their children don't have OCD or or Tourette. And so what it taught me is that it's okay to expose them to a lot of stuff as long as you talk about it and approach it appropriately. In fact, uh, this is maybe getting off topic, but I don't know if you read Harriet Hall's piece this morning from eSkeptic. Uh, it was about a, a person, a, psych a psychiatrist, who is stating that you can cure autism, well not cure, but make autistic symptoms and ADHD symptoms better if you refuse to let your kids on electronics. And <laughs> I, haven't, I haven't seen this yet. This is yeah, it's skeptic. very interesting because after what I've gone through with my kids, I'm questioning that. And of course, Harriet Hall questions it as well. And she does a beautiful job. Yeah, Harriet it. Hall says it's okay to let your kid play video games. To and she, she explained, I mean, and, and I'm not condoning, okay, let's just let your kids free for all any TV show they want without discussion and without supervision and you know, those types of things. It was in a very controlled environment. Same thing. You don't just give your kids a, a you know, a, a an electronic device and say, go to it all day, every day. You know, there's got to be other activities, etc. cetera. I, I agree with that, but I don't, I've never really restricted. We've used the electronic stuff as rewards and it was great. And I've got three kids, my youngest, we'll, we'll see how he does, but he just How many graduated. people have they murdered so far? 
saw zero. And that's the thing that's, that's amazing. Well, there you go. Success. You know, because they talk about violence. Well, my son at age uh, seven was watching extreme violence as <laughs> <laughs> to help him overcome his anxieties he kill anybody. and his own OCD. So, I mean, no, he's so calm. He's the nicest kid. He's non-violent and he's successful. He just graduated from uh, SAIT here, the, uh, uh, oh, no, I'm not going to remember what it stands for, Technical Institute, and can computer, uh, IT, computer IT. Uh -huh. There we go. And so he just last week finished his courses. So I'm very proud of him. And my oldest son has a master's in civil engineering and has a full-time job and a girlfriend and hasn't murdered anybody and yeah. <laughs> is a great kid. Well, he's adult. And my, my middle boy, who I say, as I say, he's got a little bit of those obsessive compulsive uh, tendencies, a little more than some people. And uh, he, he played collegiate golf because of that, I think. That's always my, my reasoning. I don't know how true it is, but, and he, he went to school in the US and he just got his PhD in electrical engineering. And I don't know that these kids grew up with horror films and, <laughs> and electronics yeah. and, and like anecdotal. They just said, fine. My kids yeah. have a murder a lot of help. either. So yeah, you know, it's I think team. we're doing pretty good, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> It's a team. So, you know, but I, I'm speaking from personal experience, which I know and I recognize is anecdotal, but the people that I interacted with were using methods that had been studied and I argued with and, uh, you know, and I saw success. So, uh, again, it sort of led me to you, I think. <laughs> because you... Because Sorry? Go ahead. Go ahead. Why? I was just going to say, because I even, even things like rewards, I was a big fan of Barbara Calarosa. I don't know if you know that name. She's a, a teacher from the U.S. who wrote several books. And I, again, Barbara? Barbara Calarosa. No, I don't know. And I even went to see her live. She came up to Vancouver and I saw her live. I was just like a big follower. And she advocate of no rewards, that if you reward a kid, that it, they just expect it later on in life. And it sounded like good logic to me, it was sound. But what I've learned is that it's not based in science. And what my psychologist, I'm gonna name him, Kelly Mraz is the fellow who changed my kid's life. He's one of many people, I shouldn't just name him, but uh, he, because he was the psychologist, we saw him every week almost for, for many years between the two kids. And but he said that's one of the biggest things he has to fight is the reward system because of this belief and it really was just a belief that rewards were bad it wasn't based in sound science now you have to use them carefully in the way he told me to but it, it they were highly effective and i started using them more in my classrooms just with adult students people love rewards <laughs> if it's a well i sure as heck do i think that they taught I remember my, my mom kept trying to give my kids money for grades in school. And I didn't like that. Mm. And um, I think well, I read a study about it that was saying that you need to try to find a way of making sure your child understands how the reward is their reward. Yes. Is the getting the good grades. And is that's not, a very, it shouldn't very, be a dollar amount for getting the grades. There should be yeah. you need to teach them why it is yeah. that getting the good grade is good for them. How has it helped them? And those long-term rewards are very difficult to fulfill. So short-term rewards are much better. Like at the end of the day, if you went to school, you get something. And then the next time it will be, okay, if you go to school for a week now, you get something, right? So that you, they understand if you just point blank, say after four months or after a year, you have good grades, I'll give you that. That's too far in the future. And it's very difficult right. for kids to understand. But if you said, uh, Oh boy. And I think one of the biggest things that was important for rewards is guarantee success for them to be. I mean, that sounds kind of weird that you're set, you have to set them up for success or else if they have too many failures, they're just going to get depressed and sad and frustrated. And they're not going to want to move forward because they can't anymore. Right. So, you know, we have to guarantee success at some point. I mean, there are going to be failures where they don't get the reward, but the most important part of the reward giving is short term to start with and guaranteeing success. And it's, it works beautifully. And I've, got, I've impl implemented those in my classroom. I, all these strategies in my classroom, I've implemented them when I've been coaching basketball and other things. And it's amazing how behaviors can change. 
And rewards are different depending on the person. I mean, I've been a Absolutely. manager for years. It has to be meaningful. Yeah, right? meaningful, meaningful and uh, yeah, as, as, a, as a person who's managed hundreds of people and that now I'm managing people in the Wikipedia project, everybody's a little different. And some people need different, it's just different. You have to kind of find what it is that they're here for. Do they yeah. like the attention? Do they like the numbers? Do they, you know, seeing numbers accumulate over time as people hit their Wikipedia pages? Do they like the feeling of influence? Oh. Do they like to train <laughs> other people? Right. Yeah. So oh, I get a great, uh, it's a great reward to see how many people have read my Wikipedia page. <laughs> People, they never even look. They they're not concerned at all. How many? Oh, I'm, I'm all over that one. They they don't care about how many numbers of yeah. people have viewed them. Other it's people are, are. I enjoy training. I enjoy yes. making a difference and feeling like I've made some kind of light bulb go off in somebody's head, either with the people I'm working with directly or the people who are reading the Wikipedia articles are hopefully getting some kind of information out of that. Um, yeah. So I was thinking also about, you know, when you were talking about um, the monster movies and stuff like that, I, what I had heard is to teach your children, not only to watch, you know, to do it, but to explain what's happening, how yeah. they did the makeup, how they filmed it, how, yeah. I mean, it's fake, but let's yeah. talk about how it's fake. Let's look at it. And then they would watch like movies on how the makeup is, how they create the mask and how they yeah. do the light, it becomes how it's like very music in there to make it yeah. really, uh, you know, and, and how it's done. And I think that that's a great, you know, in my mind, I think it's a great scientific way of explaining what's going on behind the scenes. And they can ask manipulated. How yeah. are we manipulated to jump? All We all jump at that yeah. same moment in the movie because We've been manipulated to, to do that. Yeah. And that's fine as long as we know we are being exactly. manipulated. I'm, but when you see these commercials on TV, buy my product within 30, you know, you've got 15 minutes to buy it and I will throw in this free can <laughs> opener. And <laughs> like, oh my that. gosh, I got to do dial right now, you know, because I don't want to get distracted and, think, and forget about it. I want my can opener, you know. Exactly. So yeah. we're manipulated. And I think the more education we have, and somebody had said earlier, and I'm sorry, because I can't remember which person it was who said it. I think it was Erica. <clears throat> she was talking about, when we were talking about explaining to a classroom and explaining to parents and explaining what's going on, uh, that when people have cognitive failure in their later years, which a lot of people do, You've kind of, uh, I'm using this word a lot lately, and, and this is my year, my word of 2020 is inoculate. When you've inoculated people around you into understanding what this means, you know, cognitive failure, how uh, people are going to start having problems and they're going to repeat themselves and they tell the same story over and over, that this is, this is, this is what's happening. It's happening in their brains. And they don't necessarily want to necessarily, mm -hmm. but it's just that is what's happening. And the more we explain, I remember in the later years of my uh, my dad's life, he was cranky and angry, and he would lash out and he would be mean, and I didn't understand why because my parents were horrible at communicating, just horrible to each other and to to the kids. And finally, my mom said to me, "He's got really bad." problems with his back and his leg and it's very painful and he doesn't mean to do that but that's what he's doing and he's lashing out because it hurts so bad of course, yeah. and the medication isn't helping or whatever and as soon as she explained that to me I said oh I get it but I didn't I did, as a kid you don't get that no you don't know until somebody explains it to you exactly and that's one thing and I I I, I feel one of the gifts if you want to call it that i would never ever want my kids to have Tourette syndrome or ocd or any of these things but the one thing it has made me is less judgmental so when i see a parent with a screaming kid in the uh, supermarket and they can't control them i've been that parent and i've actually had to walk out with groceries still you know i've never paid for them i just have to walk out with my kids so i've been that parent so now it's like can i help what can I do to help? I don't, you know, I used to get the looks like, oh, she's a bad parent. People shaking their heads, people making comments. So I think it's, it's 
created in me, I, I became a much more, a much better teacher, a much better parent, and a lot less judgmental of why people are doing what they're doing when they're out in the world. It just comes down to communication. It and, does. And compassion. Yeah. Understanding. I mean, yeah. we haven't we haven't walked in that person's feet too. Mm -hmm. You know, we don't know what they've experienced that. No day. idea. You know, you have a parent yeah. that's in the store with their child, the child's misbehaving. And yeah. we immediately assume some of us will assume that, you know, it's a bad parent or whatever. They should spank that kid and yeah. take him out. And you don't know. This might be a good day for the child. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> or the mother has to go now. The child is cranky and tired and needs a nap badly. I know I went through that with my kids many times, but sometimes this is the moment I have to go to the store. If my kid is cranky and tired, that is the way it is. I don't have any other choice. I have to go now because I have yeah. to pick up that medication. I have to pick up this. Yeah. I have to do that. And then we're out of here. And, and that's that's as far as we got. Uh, Lewis, uh, Lewis, Lewis was saying, if some, somebody like a boss wants me to do something, I have to know why. And we have stone age brains. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds and like Lois. True. <laughs> you know, and I think if we communicate better with each other, I think we can understand the differences between people. You know, we, we've got, you know, you guys in Canada, you, you're fine. Here in America, we're so just opposite in so many ways. If you get to know somebody, who's a Trump supporter as like they're your next door neighbor there. The division isn't there. You know, <laughs> you, you, you get to know them as a person, you know, you trade recipes, you look out for each other's property. You, you know, they're out of town, you mow their lawn, you know, just different things. They're great people. Yeah. They're good, kind people. And they see that in you too. The, that when you realize what their politics are, <laughs> Some, something goes up this wall goes up between you and you're like oh that <laughs> <is everything." laughs> I think the more we break that down yeah. with all things I mean when people yeah. find out I'm an atheist they're like what yeah how could you be an atheist you're too nice <laughs> you're too you're too insert insert here insert. whatever it is uh, i've had i've had many christian i have a really great christian friend a very fundamentalist christian who's told me many times you are one of the more moral people i know and if you were just a christian you would be one of the most awesome christians ever <laughs> and i'm like well thank you i guess but uh, you know it's just people who are who are different people who yeah. have not met gay people that they know of yeah. people who have met uh you know just people, people. Who, yeah we're just people and yeah. i think when you get to know them and you 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 understand their motivations and you understand where they are in life maybe maybe we would have more compassion maybe we'd exactly. be able to get through this this nightmare we're going through rob palmer says you're an atheist yes <laughs> i'm an atheist <laughs> Oh my gosh. I'm not. I'm only, you know, part of the Atheist Society of Calgary board, but you know. <laughs> <laughs> I think it just be volunteering. I, you know, it's, it's the more we're able to interact with each other and get out of this bubble a little bit, I think we're going to find ourselves in a better world. And I think yeah. that what you're doing is fabulous. Uh, I wish you. you had a bigger, bigger platform. And I guess you do with, with Wikipedia, you yeah. have a massive platform. Not that you've worked on this Tourette syndrome page, but um the the idea of the things we've been able to do i mean we rewrote the wikipedia page for facilitated communication mm -hmm. rapid prompting method we wrote spontaneous human combustion so many things that people are reading millions and millions of people are reading and they're going oh i didn't know that i didn't understand that oh i get it now and i think we're we're influencing we're yeah. at 68 million page views that's amazing uh, we might be at six 69 right now. I haven't looked this morning, but it's just incredible. And explaining for those people who are watching who don't want to join a GSW project, I have hiccups all of a sudden. <laughs> the, um, the idea is, is that explain to people, communicate, don't assume, ask questions nicely, don't, don't beat them up on social media like you're and in don't jump on people right uh -uh. automatically send them a private message and say 
are you having a bad day? Because this doesn't seem in your character, you know, and did you, was that a misspelling? And you meant to actually say this and not that? <laughs> have some compassion. They yeah. may be just having a really bad day. They may have had some very, something very bad happen to them. Exactly. Exactly. So we should probably end on this note since we're in this nice, fuzzy <laughs> moment that I, I want to feel love and compassion. I, I, I had, I, I enjoyed um, trivia last night. I'm sorry. You were third. You, uh, you were missed. Yeah. And I, I, it looks like I won't be there next week. I'll be tutoring in the evening again. Oh, I know goodness. this guy yeah. really wants to, he wants help. I just can't say no when people oh, ask for help. Not. Of course not. You probably shouldn't, but, um, so we do play trivia on Thursday nights, people on zoom. If you'd like to join, please follow us on there's It's very okay. fun. It, it's, I think it's a lot of fun. Uh, somebody Susan's wrote, a tough taskmaster though. <laughs> somebody wrote to me today, the most kindest thing. Uh, I received a message from, from someone today. She was t talking about it. And I said to her how much I enjoy running trivia. Um, it's more for me, I think, than <laughs> I get a lot out of it too. I'm really enjoying it. So we get about 30-ish people who join on trivia. It goes for hours. And it's a lot of fun and you don't have to know a lot of trivia. And they're, and they're from all over the world. Like we've had people from Australia and all yeah, across the U.S., Canada. Canada. Don't have a lot of people from, from no time zone. Yeah. No, yeah. Nobody comes from UK. And I'm thinking of doing another one of the trivias at least once a month, maybe on a Saturday or a Sunday during the morning. So In the morning. Would be involved. Of course, we'll lose the Australians. But um <laughs> That would be I nice in the winter when we don't have daytime activities to do. Yeah, there you, you go. Know, you, you do in where you are, but here. <laughs> right now it's fires and ash all over everything. So yeah. there's no activities going on here at all. Yeah, I hope it gets better. Well, it's going to get better because you can only you can only burn so much, you know, until it's all burned. Um, we're, we're supposed to be spending our time raking out in the forest right now. So uh, that's mm -hmm. what Trump says. If you rake the leaves and stuff like that, mm -hmm. we will... We will have no um, <laughs> and he's gonna pay for it <laughs> we have to well we, we should all as volunteers that's what they oh. do in Finland or Norway or something like that so oh. I don't have fires okay. is that that uh, you're supposed to rake you haven't heard this Trump blames the forest fires on us not keeping the forest clean we're supposed to rake oh my goodness he, he came to California and uh, Gavin Newsom and somebody else they were out and he's like well, if you were to rake the forest and you were to keep them clean like in Norway and, and you see the others going. Because <laughs> they know they're on camera with the president of the United States. This has been a year. And they're like. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, my goodness. Yeah, I'm surprised you haven't heard that because everybody else is going. Uh, well, there's there's just so much. I gotta go probably, you know, it, it, in the sea of Trumpisms. <laughs> I missed one. <laughs> so the DNC last night was phenomenal i had to go watch it until uh after trivia it was so good biden's speech was wonderful and they had this young man who's 13 who has a stuttering problem uh if you guys didn't catch that that no. was tear, a tear jerking moment he spoke for like wow. two minutes about how joe biden helped him with his stutter and it was incredible um i'll have to check it out yeah, it was, it was really, really good. So I'm kind of on a high right now. <laughs> I'm dying to watch the Republican um, uh, conference next week. I'm dying to see it because I've never watched any of the conferences. I've never paid attention, but I'm dying to see what they do. It's going to be super interesting to see the contrast. Um, uh, Robin Canton says we should do that in Canada and start raking the boreal forest forest <laughs> we don't have a big enough population to do that <laughs> well then you guys gotta, you better be doing double duty yeah you better get up there and start raking and uh, <laughs> yeah uh we're hearing that the boy was amazing last night the 13 year old boy who was incredible it was really 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 well done so okay awesome so to exit this um what I want to say is uh, next Wednesday, we will be on Genesis Boynton's birthday. We will be talking to Howard Shane about communication with people who have severe communication problems. This is in our part of our series with the facilitated communication that is slowly broadening into so many other worlds. Um, I also want to mention that on Tuesdays, we do at three o'clock California time, we have the Australian Prediction Project with Richard Saunders. We are evaluating claims made by Australians 
psychics over the last 20 years, evaluating them to see if the claim is actual, has any oomph to it. We're learning a lot about celebrities. <laughs> Nicole Kidman oh, yeah. is one that comes up all the time because she's Australian. Mm -hmm. And uh, we're, we have a group of people who meet on Zoom and we talk about the predictions one at a time. Is this true? It's Has fun. there been more fires in, in um, Iran in 2012 than normal? You know, so we have to go look. Has Was there more fires in there or not? Um, I have people come and go too with that too. Yeah, right? people so. come and go. So you don't have to be there all the whole time. Trivia is on Thursday night. Uh, the UK skeptics do trivia, not trivia, uh, talks um on thursdays it's 11 o'clock my time the uh, cfi center for inquiry does a talk on thursdays every other week you guys have a um at your group and you didn't plug your plug your conference and plug yes, your talk uh, we can reason the western canadian reason we conference can. will be yeah will be on uh may 15th and hopefully <laughs> i hope they think things settle down by yeah, then once or twice but, ready, huh? yeah and in, until then we're doing monthly webinars online so you just join through meetup or take and uh, take a look through meetup or look at our website uh, www.atheistcalgary.com and all the information is there we have some great things coming forward we have a fellow or a woman this next week who is going to be talking about death and dying in different cultures we have uh, Confessions of a Gay Preacher author coming up in October. Um, and we have, I'm just trying to think of our September one off the top of my head. Uh, but go, go to Meetup and you'll see it all. We have some great talks coming, coming up of all different kinds of, of uh, topics. Abhijit from India is going to do a talk for us after Christmas. So we're gonna, we, we've got a great lineup. So check it out on Meetup yeah, and our Definitely talk. check this out. And, uh, Adrian just released her uh, her first Wikipedia page from scratch. Yes. That took a while for her to get that out, as she said, this perfectionist kind of attitude that she has. <laughs> but it was Yasmin uh, Muhammad, very interesting person. I had I loved reading her Wikipedia page, and uh, she will be at the Weekend Reason Conference yes. in uh, May in Calgary, yes. Canada. And so will Susan. Susan. I hope to be there, and Mark Edward as well. Um, we plan it. It's in my book. I, I, I have something to look forward to. Yes, um, I hope it I hope it runs. Oh, and I do. Going, and if you don't mind going back to the Toretto CD Alberta Network, check out their website. Just Google the Toretto CD Alberta Network and it should come up. And I will be doing a talk in October about uh, Tourette syndrome and then in December about OCD. And it will be online. It will be virtual and it will be more formal slides, more informative. So check that out as well. Let's well, Susan ranting and asking questions on, um, on this. Uh, yeah. Well, this so, is good. I've never done anything like this before. So oh, awesome. I, I like the conversation better yeah. than lectures, I think it's it's just more personal and it's yeah. I, I, it's for me, I, you know, <laughs> I don't care about these other people watching. It's, I find it interesting. It's, it's, it's fun. The, um, uh, about time channel, I have put it in the links that we have, please subscribe. Um, we have a ton of talks just like this one here in, in that, um, if you'd like to suggest talks, please let me know. And, um, we are a 501c3, 501c3, whatever. You can donate money to us by PayPal and they take a very small percentage out of it that allows us to be able to uh, pay for our Zoom account and uh, some of the other things we do. We do stings uh, with psychics. We do, um, once we get back to normal, we can have conferences again where people go. We're going to be funding a lot of scholarships for people to attend um, the different conferences that are around the globe. And also we uh use the money for other various things i have an article that just came out on um psychics grief vampires i call them it just right, came out it's skeptical inquire skeptical inquire and i have another one coming out that will be coming out in a few few days probably early next week on how the psychic could not have known there's no way the psychic could have known and um mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so we're getting people who are saying thank you so much. And I'd like to say that as well, Adrian, thank you for giving me so much of your time this morning. I really appreciate that it. That was fun. Um, yeah, it was a lot of fun talking to you. And I got a lot of questions answered and I was able to uh, get a better understanding of this. So now I think I will be able to, if I see the situation or somebody I know of who 
ask a question, I think I have a lot more resources to be able to say, I have a vague idea. I think I understand what's going on. And here's what, it, here's what it seems to, here's a place to go to get better resources. Yeah. Uh, and even if it's not Tourette syndrome, it could be something that's not controllable. Right. And, and having again, that understanding yeah, is to important. Explain, this is yeah. probably not your child acting out. It, yeah. I mean, or an it, adult it be. who's being strange, doing something, you know, yeah. there might be a, a neurological reason. It could be an emotional reason. We don't know. It's not a mental illness, right? That's not designed as a, we wouldn't say mental illness. We would, and it's not a virus. It's a, it's a just mental disorder. Yeah. It's, it's an interesting thing because I know people in the Trek community are very divided with that. I think oh, it's, I, it's I think it's really wrong to shy away from the word mental illness. I think it stigmatizes it. So I think that if you want to call it mental illness, uh, I, I, I love, uh, I think it was Lois who said, they're not mental illnesses or physical illnesses because it is brain chemistry gone awry. So they are physical and it can be seen in scans. So especially OCD, you can see the brain lighting up uh, particularly strangely. So, you know, they, they really are physical, but we've always called them mental because we think they're from the brain that, that people are trying to do it, et cetera. So it has a bit of a history. So I think if we realize that it's actually a physical thing, and they don't have the control, they have some control, but they don't have as much control as we think they do. I think it's a good way of thinking about it. So uh, and ADHD have always been called uh, under that umbrella. Uh, you can just call it uh, a disorder. I think it's it's perfectly fine. Uh, like everything is a little more disorder. Exactly. There's I mean, no, there's no like, oh, here's a word we use and this is the Yeah. Word. So yeah, there, there is some divisiveness. People get very uh, sort of, they don't want to be stigmatized. And I think that's a problem. Let's get, just get rid of the worrying about that. There's a lot of worry about having my kids labeled, even with OCD and, and Tourette syndrome and all these other things. But it was tremendous help. It was huge. And it was so important to have those it opens labels. Doors. It opens doors. And in America, you were able to get diagnosis. You were able to get some, some financial help with that. Exactly. So, you know, they were able to bring in aids for my kids because they get more resources as a result. And so it was really, really helpful. And my kids, especially, my, yeah, I guess my youngest too, they both needed aids at certain times. So, you know, they, the school gets extra funding and they can help other kids as well. So it doesn't just stick because my kids don't need help every day. So other kids get help. So it benefits everybody to have those uh, labels. So about if you want to call a mental illness, it's fine. Uh, it's because it, it, it's, it, it is a disorder. I guess illness is the problem, illness right? Illness is the problem because it makes yeah. it sound like it's something you can get over. Yeah, exactly. That you can't. disorder. And you don't. Could be maybe a better way of explaining it. I think yeah. I've always said there's something, there's something in the brain that's happening that is not typical. And correct. It's physical, as I say. Yeah. it's. I like thinking of it as physical, but even if it's not a correct term. <laughs> Whatever, you guys, get yeah. over it. Just <laughs> I'm not a doctor. The I can say that. that there's no... <laughs> that communicate, you know, yeah. so eh, 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 get yeah. out of your little square box. Yeah. So I don't tend to get too upset about that, but some people do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I didn't know. Okay. <laughs> All right, everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Adrian. Thank you so much. Who, uh, stayed with us this whole time on two hours. I know. It's awesome. Two hours. People have stayed I told you I could talk about it forever. Oh, I, I could do it. <laughs> well, I have to go to the bathroom. <laughs> and my kid i think is still in the driveway he's doing something with this car and he wants to get these grapes and i don't understand why he doesn't open the door come in whatever i have to go find out what's going on okay but, you know, everybody's a little paranoid around here all right thank you so much everybody <laughs> bye now well, this will be on youtube so watch for it in a day or so